what, what are you looking at? What are your takeaways this morning? And how much of it is just, does it come down to, as Pat Buchanan said, political athleticism and what athlete fits the position that you're trying to get them to win? This is an unmitigated disaster for the Democrats. We're about an eighth of the way okay, through, th through, yeah. Donald, through Donald Trump's, <laughs> through Donald Trump's term. We're an eighth of the way through. And, you know, to paraphrase Pauline Kael, most of the people in the liberal wing of the party think, of course, Donald Trump is a disaster. Everyone in the country hates him. Of course, everything's going to be a referendum on him. This, no, this is not a perfect test. I don't think Ossoff was that bad a candidate. I take your point about not being a perfect fit for the district, but it is one of the most educated districts in the country. And he wasn't running against the best political athlete of all time, the new congresswoman-elect. The reason I think this is such a disaster for Democrats is they put everything in, as you said. This was a race that they could have won, and they, and they came up short. And you talk about candidate recruitment. Could they have recruited a better candidate than Ossoff? The problem is it's easy to say if you've got a strong party, we're going to recruit candidates to match the districts. But the liberal wing of the party is ascendant. And so in a lot of the primaries that are coming up that will determine who their nominees are, they can't recruit and be sure they're going to get nominees who are the perfect fit. They're going to get a lot of liberal nominees, a lot of nominees who are maybe too liberal to win. So the only silver lining the Democrats, I think, can look at here is Ossoff wasn't the perfect candidate. But he was a strong candidate in fundraising. He was a strong candidate in enthusiasm. He proved to be pretty able on the campaign trail. They, I think, have to look at this and say the main takeaway for me is if the liberals think that a referendum on Trump is going to carry them to the majority, Last night proved that's just not the case, even though Donald Trump has laid down a record now that voters could look at in that very well-educated district and say, what do we want, someone who will vote for the president's agenda or someone who won't? And they voted for someone who will. And Mika, you, um, I, I don't want to offend anybody here, but I, if, if the Democrats want to start winning, I feel like I need to say this. Um, I have a lot of friends that, and loved ones that have been out in these marches that go, uh, you know, every week they'll be marching about something else. I've been saying all along, if you need to do that, if that makes you feel good, then do that. But understand, if you want to change America and you want to change the world, you're much better off going into districts, campaigning for somebody, knocking on doors, mm -hmm. handing them flyers getting into phone banks, picking up the phones, calling people, finding people, recruiting candidates, not that look just like you and think just like you, but that actually fits the district that they're, they're winning on. This is something Republicans decided to do years ago and that they didn't just worry about the big prize, they built from school boards yeah. up to city council people, up to county commissioners yeah. on every level. Marching in the streets, Great pictures, exactly. makes you look good, does not win elections. Well, here's what I said to one of my best <coughs> friends who, who took part in the Women's March, and it's to your point, um, you know, they're great. The, uh, but you're shouting in the street, you're chanting, you're singing with people who agree with you. So going out and knocking on doors, as you talked about, gets you listening. And we're seeing uh, the same problem that we've seen all along. The same problem we saw when we had uh, the second in command of the DNC on the show who just seemed to be going off and spouting, come on, man, this, we're good, we're going to be good. No, what's the message? What is, what is going to bring people in? I think, Willie, the mistake that Democrats make is to think the president's at 36 percent. There are some obvious problems with the Republican Party and with this presidency. Of course people are going to come to us. No, we're not inevitable. This isn't ours. We have to work for it. That's what Democrats need to say to themselves. What's the message? What's the jobs message? And the irony here, though, is, is that Ossoff didn't talk a lot about Donald Trump. We said you can't just be anti-Trump. His message wasn't purely anti-Trump. And in fact, a lot of progressives thought it wasn't enough so, that it was too moderate, that they tried to paint him moderate right. uh, in this district where he was going to need to be a little bit more moderate, talking about spending cuts and things like that. And you had groups like MoveOn.org coming out last night saying, we can't run candidates like this. We've got to stay true to our progressive roots. Roots. Not clear that would have worked in this district either. Uh, Noah Rothman, let me go to you on this. Uh, what's your view? What's the takeaway if you're a Democrat thinking about running in 2018? What do you have to do better than has been done in these special elections so far? Well, it's, it strikes me that Democrats are engaged, are enthused. Their problem is that Republican voters in Republican districts are not yet demoralized. Um, and I've seen some Democrats even before these results saying, 
what we've been saying on this panel today, that it can't be all about Donald Trump, it has to be a message for something, and specifically we should start talking about health care. Uh, if you want to demoralize a Republican, you ask them what the Republican Congress has done with their historic majorities, what they've done with the president, what they've done with ha control of half the union uh, without o much opposition. Um, you start knocking on doors and talking about what Republicans are going to do to Republican voters, you're going to remind Republican voters why they vote Republican in a hurry. Uh, and I think we're going to start seeing some uh, approach that's very similar to what we've been talking about here, which is we need to focus on a message, get progressive, get liberal, and get not only Democrats engaged, but enthuse people in the margins. Uh, and that might work in some uh, blue-collar districts, because we have seen some, some interesting spikes in, in formerly Democratic, now Republican voting voters in places like South Carolina last night. Uh, but I'm not entirely sure that's going to be enough to overtake an incumbency. And, uh, you know, you've got a lot of incumbents that you're going to have to knock off to retake the majority. Harold, there's the obvious immediate implication of this election, which is that Karen Handel is, remains a Republican vote as we go into this health care discussion in Washington. What else does it do, though? If you're a Republican thinking about maybe retiring, do you stay in? Does this change your calculus at all of what 2018 looks like? I think it changes the calculus in two fronts. One, Republicans now feel fortified and uh, will have more courage to stand with this president on matters that are serious to the overall Republican agenda, health care, and the economic message. Two, Democrats, we have to leave this progressive thing alone, alone as aggressively as we're dealing with it. There's no doubt, as Mika and Joe and others have said, it brings people together. But if this message alone would carry us to victory, we'd have a majority in the House and the Senate. This nonsense that Democrats talked about after the 16 election that Hillary Clinton won by more than 3 million votes, uh, the, the popular vote, so that means that we're popular amongst the country. That means nothing. It, it would have meant something if we'd won more governor's seats, if we'd won more House seats, if we'd won more Senate seats. In fact, we all know the membership of Democrats in the House and Senate <coughs> is as small as it's been in the House in almost 100 years. We need a change. There's no doubt the enthusiasm is there, but without a message about cutting taxes and creating jobs and providing more economic security, there's no amount of yelling, there's no amount of screaming, and there's no amount of pretending that we're ready, and there's no amount of organizing Amber. in cities where Democrats already win by large, large margins yeah. that's going to change the fact that we're in the minority. Now, again, I like the enthusiasm, but we've got to translate that enthusiasm to something else. I think the real message tonight, Joe, this morning, is what happened in South Carolina. Could there, could we have recruited a different candidate in Georgia? I don't know if I fully agree with Mark about Ossoff. I think he's a good guy and a smart guy, but could we have identified a better candidate and two could, should we have spent more money in South Carolina uh, to, to, to help the young fellow or the, the fellow Parnell who was a South Carolinian I think if you did then the RNC would have gone in and thrown a lot more money yep. at Norman so that's hard to say but but y y you you do find Harold and you know this and that's so why I, I want to talk to you because you've been on the ground and you understand it uh, if you are in San Francisco, you run like a San Francisco candidate. If you're in Seattle, you do the same thing. If you're in Nebraska, you try to match there. But for Democrats, when they go into the Deep South, this is, this is a region that Democrats used to dominate. And even when I was in Congress, there were, and you were in Congress, there were Democrats there. And some of them were pro-life, and some of them were pro-gun. Uh, and uh, but they were also they were progressive when it came to economics. They were progressive on 90 percent of the other issues, but they checked off the boxes culturally in those southern districts, Harold. And that's why I, I, I've been trying to say this to my Democratic friends for some time. I was trying to say it last night. If you've got a guy who's with you on 90 percent of the issues and he's 60. progressive when it comes to taxes, or even if you have a woman that's with you on 80 percent of the issues, but she's Catholic and she's pro-life because she actually believes what her church says and her family's been going out hunting in Tennessee for five generations. So she's pro-Second Amendment as well. Now. There are Democrats who actually told me last night mm. when we were going back and forth on Twitter, no, that is not called a Democrat. That's called a Republican. I would never mm. vote for him. Our party can never. And so my response was, well, you will never win in the South. Um, talk about that, how Democrats are going to have to get a little uncomfortable when they're in the South. 
and do what Ronald Reagan said. Be with somebody if they're with you 80% of the time. I think you're going to have to be that way across the country. I would much rather, I've said on the show with you, I'd much rather have a pro-life Democrat, and I'm pro-choice, but a pro-life Democrat in the House or the Senate who would support Pelosi and Hoyer to be leader and support uh, Schumer to be leader and Durbin to be leader in the Senate than I would a pro-life Republican who would vote the other way. Democrats, we have to awaken to these realities. People want us back in charge, not for us to dictate how they live their, how they live their lives in their bedrooms and their local communities. They want us to help create jobs and opportunity. That's why Trump won. And if we don't understand a lot what Barnacle was saying early on about Scott Brown and others, we're going to find ourselves having this conversation, unfortunately, for a longer time than we want. You know what they could do, Joe? Yeah, let me... Uh yeah. The, the Democrats would be well advised to go back and look at one of the great speeches Hubert Humphrey gave in his wonderful life about the dawn of life and the dusk of life. And the Democratic Party is here to take care of you in certain ways, not to go into your bedroom, yep. not to affect you culturally every single moment of every day, but just take care of your lives. Yeah. Noah Rothman, what's the takeaway for Republicans here? Uh, is is, the, is uh, the concept of moral hazard blown out of the water now for the next year and a half for Donald Trump? <laughs> yeah, I, I suppose, I, I, well, the window for, you know, aggressive legislative achievements has been closing for some time. The closer we get to 2018, the harder those votes are going to be. Uh, if they had lost this race, th there would be a lot more uh, cold sweats this morning from Republicans, so they have bought themselves a little bit more time. But like I said before, Republicans really do expect to see some legislative achievements out of this Congress. They do want to see Obamacare repealed. They do want to see tax code reform, not just a tax cut that expires in 10 years. So they do have some work that they have to do, and they've bought themselves some time. Um, but they would be advised to take a look at how Democrats are overperforming in these races and look to 2018 a little fearfully. There are uh, enough Republicans in Hillary Clinton districts to retake the House, and that should be hanging over their heads like a cloud. I agree. Yeah, and Mika, we've been talking about the first 15, 20 minutes about how bad this is for Democrats. It is important to say on the other side of it, too, just to tell you what Democrats are saying, and they have a point. If we show what that chart we just put up there, in every special election, Democrats have come up short. They've come up short in Democratic districts, but in Montana, they lost by six instead of 21 in November, seven in Kansas instead of 27. Of course, in Georgia, uh, Karen Handel overperformed Donald, outperformed Donald Trump, which probably speaks right now to his unpopularity. <laughs> and in South Carolina, uh, th plus three, whereas in November it was plus 18. So, and again, most of the smart money probably still is with the Democratic Party taking over. But this should be a wake up call for the Democratic Party, who has been doing nothing but losing since 2010 in these legislative races. And at some point, you know, I, 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 heard, um, I heard last night Ossoff get off there saying, we've started something great. No, you lost. At some point, the time for, for moral victories is over, and sometimes winning is just about winning. They need to learn from this and figure out how to win next year. Well, we're going to have uh, much more ahead in this key race. We're going to bring in the Washington Post, Robert Costa, who's been on the ground reporting in Georgia. Also ahead, we'll speak with Democratic Senators Kirsten Gillibrand and Chris Murphy and Republican Senator Bill Cassidy. And tomorrow night, Joe and his band will be playing at the Cutting Room here in New York City. The special performance is to mark the release of Joe's new EP entitled Mystified. Doors open around 7.30 p.m. Joe, save that voice, but we'll see you after the break. Let's Thanks. Thanks for checking out MSNBC on YouTube and make sure you subscribe to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories and you can click on any of the videos around us to watch more for Morning Joe and MSNBC. Thanks so much for watching.